seriously speaking, the South wishes to be the bastion of education. I may be able to say that our grandfathers, or great grandfathers, were already attending the Oxford and the Cambridge before anybody else tried it in Black Africa. But something has gone wrong, especially in the last 10 years. I don't know, but the worst, you are not cultured. If you're not properly educated, you begin to have problems with your culture. In the last 10 years, some things have happened, and that is why I'm associating myself with this laudable program. In the past years that I've been speaker, I've had the opportunity of seating in meetings with the Offending for Strategic Planning or Renewal Group, as we call them. So as to pick their brain in what I'm supposed to be doing in the House of Representatives. And I have no apologies for that. In the last 10 years, it seems that the fields in which the Yorubas have been performing, it seems that we've been relegated to sometimes even third or fourth positions. For example, private sector and banking industry. We used to control about 75, 80% of this. Only four or five of the 25 banks are now of Yoruba extraction. So we're no longer leading in business of those who provide the funds for business. It has gone to a, another section of our country in the southern part of Nigeria. Secondly, information. That is, those who decide what we read and what we see and therefore think and decide on very important decisions that will affect our future namely print and electronic media. Again, 10 years ago, you may find 8 out of 10. Today, the 8 out of 10 has gone to another section of our country in southern part of Nigeria. Talking about television, private television. Again, if I can Mention five, all of them are in a different zone of the country in the southern part of Nigeria. So we no longer determine how our children think. We no longer determine what they watch, what information they can assess, and therefore decisions that they will take. That is why some people now decide to um, put morality as a signboard in front of their house and claim that they know more than their fathers. I don't want to say too much because I may get in trouble since I'm not speaker of Southwest. <laughs> but I think these are things that the Yoruba Academy would have to face and correct so that we may have a future. So that many years from now, when I hope and pray I get as old as our Babazi, some younger element will call me to tell me how well Yoruba race is doing.
I'm going to use this opportunity to say some of the things that we have managed to achieve in the last two and a half years. The political party that I come from, fortunately for us in the Southwest, is on the position of the speaker. Well, like I said, once I'm the speaker, I'm not speaker of that political party, I'm speaker of all political parties. I will now use this opportunity, this, this opportunity to go into some of the things that I've written down here. As representatives of the people, that make up a modern democratic society. We are conscious that we are holding power on, on trust or in trust because majority of citizens, majority will come up, will come and talk about INEC and electoral reform later. Because majority of citizens yielded their individual rights, thereby giving the state enough power to protect their well-being by protecting their property lives and fundamental human rights. We're striving to actualize the essence of social contract between the government and the government by taking appropriate legislative and administrative actions that are aimed at creating the enabling environment for culture, business, happiness to thrive. I'm sure you've heard all this before. Now, it's in the pursuit of this necessary ideals that we insist on bringing to bear the meaning of Section 4, Subject 2 of the 1999 Constitution, which gives the National Assembly, and I quote, the power to make laws for the peace, order, and government of the Federation. Section 80, Subsection 3 also says, which is perhaps more important to me anyway, that no monies shall be withdrawn from the public fund of the Federation other than the consolidated revenue fund of the Federation unless the issue of those monies has been authorized by an act of the National Assembly. I think basically we're talking about corruption and what has happened to our country in the last 50 years. Power to make laws for the peace, order, and good governance of the Federation. I may go to say that we made something out of that a few weeks ago, a few months ago when the issue of acting parliament came up. Now, ladies and gentlemen, under my leadership, the House of Representatives has repeatedly beamed its searchlight on the pattern of implementation of national budgets. In fact, we've changed the way budgets have been done in Nigeria in the last two years. The week after I became speaker, the executive brought the budget of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to the House. It was a budget of 1.6 trillion. What is six, between 500, 550 billion capital side, which is where you're supposed to bring development from. And, <coughs> During that year, or rather in the budget proposal, they brought an item called unspent funds. I need you to please listen to this. Unspent funds, which means it's going to be returned to the Treasury to form the next budget. The figure was 21 billion out of 550 billion, which means that uh, the budget must have performed by 95%. But we all knew the budget was performing around 30, 35. So where's the difference? Where is the difference? So I said, okay. I'm the, I was the deputy chairman of the finance committee before I became speaker. So I, knew, I had an idea of some of these things. So after asking questions, two, three weeks later, 21 billion became 450 billion. 450 billion. That's the difference. You now ask yourself, 
what would have happened to that money? Or what has been happened to the money as many years before? No arrest was made, though. No arrest was made. In any case, the following year, we didn't have to ask these questions. The president himself brought an unspent fund of 350 billion before we needed to ask any question. Okay, so we started. But the other problem that I faced was that we knew that monies were being collected, and this is where section 80, subsection 3 comes in, by revenue generating agencies in collusions with consultants. But these monies were not being remitted into the treasury. So we started asking questions from civil servants, not from any special consultant anywhere, from those who are actually spending the money. And we discovered an average of between 800 billion to a trillion every year was not being remitted. And these are figures from the civil service. I wonder if we apply one of our doctor consultants here to check. Those figures will not be one trillion. We've submitted our report. No arrest has been made. In fact, what you find is all sorts of um, campaign, all sorts of, which we're used to anyway. So we talk about boom, and got a boom on set. Abi? Now, we even discovered in one, one single agency, a young post authority, where 11 billion was remitted out of 548 billion. So I don't know who EFCC, ICPC are looking for. It got so bad that I had to take the floor myself and introduce a bill titled A Bill for an Act to Make Provisions for the Creation of the National Office of Government Performance, Audit, and Accountability to ensure that public funds are judiciously accounted for. Of course, at the public hearing, the civil servants came and totally condemned it. But when I am the speaker, it will work. It will work. Because this agency is supposed to give us figures of performance on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, monthly basis, quarterly basis, over the medium term of three year or five year budgets, which can be rolled on two or three times to see where we'll be 2020 right now. So when government officials give us a particular figure, we can double check on our own. Because if you're going to inspect someone, and you're expecting him to give you the figures, so you're going to inspect him, obviously he's going to tell you what he wants. This is not a national problem alone. It's in the states and local government too. Every part of this country. We have a budget of 4.6 trillion, which we passed this year, last week. 4.6 trillion. 50% of that money is going to be spent at the state and local government level. 50%. In fact, in most cases, that 50% is going to be spent by the government of the state because the local government chairman are proxy appointees. 50% of 4.6 trillion. I don't know of any state assembly that would ask questions on that money. And when they do, we know what happens to them. And this is the money that is going to affect the day-to-day -day activities of all of us. It has a 100% higher rate of effect than money spent by the federal government in Abuja. That is the money that matters. 20 something percent of it is being spent by the local government. That is the one that matters most. Who are our councillors? What caliber of people are our councillors? What caliber of people are legislators of the state? Those are the people who should ask questions on your money.
with all due respect, electoral reform, yes, we will reform. We'll do all that. The process is on. But if a political party in any state or national wins 80% of the seats, it will never be considered free and fair, even if it was. In any state, there are 12,500, I think, electable political offices in this country. Only 37 are executive. Governors, president, and they run the vice and the deputy run the same tickets anyway. The 74, 774 local government chairman, please, I call them commissioner for local government. No disrespect to them, because the performance of state INEC is woeful. If anything, I'm worse than that of the INEC. It is the state INEC. So we have a situation whereby you have 12,000 legislators who are supposed to be asking questions. That is your political class, electable. Yet nobody cares who they are. So who's going to ask these 37 people the right questions? Maybe that's why we have a 95% return rate for these executive seats and a 98% non-return rate for the legislators. Who likes to be asked questions? Especially when the 37 have an effective power to make sure that those who ask them don't come back. And we wonder why things are going wrong in our country when nobody can ask questions about your money. They say absolute power corrupts absolutely. Irrelevant of what political party you belong to. So yes, after decades of military government, it is natural for Nigerians to expect to see rapid developmental changes. However, we must all work together to achieve this. It comes, out, it comes back to the point whereby we're looking for, we're looking for committed partnership between leaders and followers. Leaders and followers. When leaders do well, and they come under incredible criticisms, sometimes life-threatening, and the followers, through pressure groups, do not come to their aid. Are you giving me time, sir? Okay. Well. I will, how much have I, I mean, how much, how many? <laughs> anyway, they say the main objectives on ongoing electoral reform is to achieve an institute violence free, free and fair, transparent and credible elections by making the votes of the electorate count. Making the votes of the electorate count. In the votes of the electorate count. The easiest thing to do is to blame Professor Ewu and the rest of them at INEC. But I dare ask, say, how many of us know who our counselors are? With all due respect. How many of us even know who our House of Assembly members are? How many of us care who they are? But we all want to care who the governor is. We all want to care maybe who the, who the senator is. Well, constitutional review, constitutional amendment, constitutional alteration, whichever you want to call it, it is happening. And nothing is going to stop it. It has never happened in the history of this nation. It is happening now. The Senate last week voted on over 25 amendments. The House started yesterday the clause-by-clause -clause debate on their own amendments. After the Easter holidays, we shall vote. 
and your constitution is thereby amended. It is going to happen. Now, you may not be totally satisfied with what you get, but you are getting something now. It's a beginning. Constitutional amendment is not a one-year process or a four-year process or a hundred-year process. It's a continuous process. And we will start with something, and we have started with something. Ten years couldn't achieve it. Last one year is about to achieve it. There were a lot of criticisms about Senate and House not working together in the beginning for this. But nobody bothered to ask, was that by convention or by constitution? Because most conventions that we do apparently do not get us the results that we require. So we decided, no, we'll follow the constitution. Senate, sit and decide. House, sit and decide. When we get to the time to join in a session, it's only to vote, not to talk. So there must be competition. Competition came, senators performed. House is about to vote. Then we'll meet and now vote as a session. That's what the Constitution says. I would love to come some other time and talk some more of some of the challenges that we have as a nation and as a people of the Southwest region and beyond, because they are Yorubas in Edo, they are Yorubas in Edo, Kogi, and so on and so forth. My appeal to my brothers in the Yoruba Academy, who have thought it necessary for this academy to come up, our Babas, who have thought it necessary to encourage them, should understand that it's not, of course, a 100 meter race. This is a long distance race. We're no longer in the forefront, and we've realized it. By realizing it, it's half gone already. By going for it to get back to the front, other zones will fight with everything they have as well. We'll do our well. Thank you very much.